evening's public event. So Tanya is a professor in the Department of Social Sciences within the Faculty of Arts, Design and Social Sciences. Her research specializes in green and environmental criminology. Her recent research has focused on crimes against the environment and non-human species and has looked at trafficking. Tanya has been leading Northumbria's environmental and global justice multidisciplinary research theme. This is one of a number of themes that we have within the university where we conduct world-class research to meet today's global challenges. Um, Tanya currently holds uh, a fellowship, a leadership fellowship with uh, HRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, where she looks at, you investigate compliance with CITES, which is the Convention for International Trade Against Endangered Species, I think. <laughs> and I should say, I've done loads of these things, so I know exactly how it now goes. What I now do is I say, Prior to her role at Northumbria University, Professor Wyatt was at University X, where she was a lecturer in Y, and she studied <laughs> Z. What it actually says is, <laughs> prior to her role at Northumbria University, Tanya was a deputy sheriff, <laughs> which included working in a maximum security county jail and patrolling a small town. <laughs> we could use you on the vice chancellor's office. <laughs> <laughs> She then served two years as the United States Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine during the time she wrote grants and designed programs to prevent the trafficking of women. So we're, you know, we're really in a position with Tanya where we have somebody who has a very different experience from what many of the academics in this organisation have. And that, that is something I think we really value very strongly. And, and Tanya has been a great success, obviously, while she's been here, as we see, because today is her inaugural lecture. So in this evening's lecture, Tanya will argue that criminology is human-centred. She hopes to challenge the status quo, which she argues in, instigates and perpetuates injury to the planet. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Tanya Wyatt. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone so much for coming. It's really lovely to see you all. Uh, it's so nice to see many of my colleagues, uh, as well as friends, um, and people that I don't know that I hope to get to meet. Uh, to me, an inaugural, inaugural lecture uh, is about your contribution to your discipline. And so I think I need to start by saying a very uh, clear recognition that so much of my work has not been done alone, and that I've had a lot of influence and contributions from people that I've worked with. So some of the people that are most influential to me are here tonight, though they might be here tomorrow for an event we have on. So I just would recognize Professor Nigel South, uh, Professor Matthew Hall, Dr. Angus Nurse, but some of my close colleagues. Um, thanks to the newer influences, and I think future collaborators that are here with me tonight, Rachel Dunn, James Hayden, Francis Massé, you've already in the short time you've known each other, uh, influenced the way that I think. Thanks to all of my PhD students, some of you are here, some of you are in Vietnam and elsewhere in the world, uh, but it's really been a way that I have, have grown uh, uh, as an academic. Thanks to my colleagues here at Northumbria, there's far too many of you to name uh, that have been so helpful to me uh, for intellectual debates and just the support in the, in the area of academia. In particular, though, I, my scholarship has improved and grown because of Professor Pam Davies, my close colleague and friend, so thanks to her. Um, excuse me. Uh, my volleyball teammates who are here tonight, which maybe isn't very typical, but uh, you're essential to my mental health outside of here, so thank you guys for coming. That, that's amazing to see you. Uh, but most of all, of course, I would not be here if it were not for Ed, uh, who we go for daily walks and he gets to listen to me rant about the injustices of the world. Uh, and tonight is largely uh, maybe a compilation of those rants uh, and maybe some indication of how we can actually uh, improve the planet and, and make changes. I'm going to start actually because not I know not all of you are criminologists, so I'm just going to give a really brief uh, introduction to why criminology to my mind, and you know, many of us writing in the green field, has ignored the non-human for so long. And that moves into what is a green criminology and what that actually looks like. And then how I think through these three elements I'm gonna focus on around harm, violence, and speciesism about 
making the non-human in the environment uh, much more visible. So criminology is it historically really been confined within very limited boundaries. Uh, I think if you talk to the average person on the street, they would tell you, well, what's a criminologist if you look at crime? Uh, and it is much broader than that, but though historically it's really just only looked at what is illegal. And it's been really stripped within disciplinary boundaries. So sociology, law, maybe a bit of psychology. Scholars challenge that though, and, I, and, and some of those those scholars here, again, uh, Pam Davies, uh, Professor Peter Francis, uh, with their colleague back in 1999, looking at uh, invisible crimes. What makes things stay hidden? Uh, what makes something be defined a crime and something else not be defined a crime? Their work, uh, work with Frank Pierce and others, really challenged that system and that discourse uh, and opened it up to new disciplines beyond just law, psychology, and sociology, like I mentioned. How is the non-human sat within all of this? Uh, it, it wasn't completely absent, uh, but you would only see the environment and nature, maybe the non-human animal, if it was relevant to some specific piece of legislation. So if something was illegal, specifically designed within a criminal legislation, then you would actually, you maybe, uh, the environment or other animals would be, would be visible started to gain more traction and more visibility, I'd argue, uh, within this sort of subfield around corporate and organized crime. So you have um, you know, really groundbreaking work by people like Steve Toombs uh, and Dave White looking at the Bhopal disaster, for instance, in India, where you have uh, an industrial plant explode with, with cyanide. Uh, so there's an environmental element to that, but it's really sort of at one point in history grounded in corporate and organized crime studies. It also started to feature the environment, I mean, uh, around marginalization of, of minorities. So you have concern that uh, if you are from a marginalized community, chances are you have a much less healthy environment. And then finally, uh, in the late 1990s, well, the, the term green criminology first gets used in 1990, uh, by an American scholar in, an, in, a, uh, in a coverage of a conference uh, conversation, actually, Mike Lynch. Uh, but in the 1990s in this country, you have uh, Nigel South, who I mentioned uh, as, a, as a thank you, because he's been tremendously influential on me, uh, really arguing that we need to have a criminology of the environment, because there's lots of serious issues there. So you have this emergence of of a green criminology. And at the same time, in other disciplines, you, you have an emergence as well. Uh, Earth jurisprudence, wild law is also a, a related area emerging in the 1990s. So you have this, finally, you have this dedicated study of, of crimes against nature. Rob White, probably one of uh, the most influential green criminologists, if not the kind of green criminologist uh, at the University of Tasmania. He defines it as, as green criminology being this exploration of transgressions, not just of what is criminal, but what is harmful. And we're not just looking at humans, we're looking at the environment and non-human animal too. It is looking at corporations and powerful actors. So what is the role of the state in destroying our environment? There's a lot to be said there and a lot more research to be done. So these these institutions and the people that have uh, influence over these institutions, they have the capacity to shape what the definition of crime actually is. So what we see is that so much of what is harmful to the environment is actually allowed. Uh, it might be within you know, gradations and at some point it becomes criminal, but pollution, it's allowed. It, it's only when it gets to a certain threshold that, that we talk about it in terms of crime. It does then obviously become a very contentious and ambiguous kind of concept uh, that, that White has talked about for, for many years. So we do talk, as a green criminologist, we talk a lot about harm. We don't just look at what's illegal. What can we challenge that's happening out there that's causing hurt, suffering uh, on the planet or on non-humans, even plants? We do look at laws, uh, the AHRC Fellowship uh, that George referred to earlier that I hold right now, it is a, a legal study of how countries are actually protecting species that are supposed to be protected by this international convention. 
what happens to the people that are caught? How are they sentenced? What sort of uh, responsibility uh, are they given? How are, how are they held accountable is part of what we research. And then we look at regulation as well. So it's not just about the criminal, there's all the civil and administrative uh, elements to it that also play a, a really big part. And particularly in the UK context, the civil law around environment is huge. And the Environment Agency are very open about the fact that criminal law is the last kind of resort that they will go to. It is about negotiation and then about civil legislation first. How has the non-human been addressed in a green criminology then? Even green criminology, historically, maybe less so, I'd argue it's probably gotten better, uh, has been human-centric. There's certainly a branch of people that are only interested in environmental justice. So the idea that there's differences in human populations, and maybe if you are uh, an ethnic minority, if you're a woman, if you're from a poor area, chances are you might have a less healthy environment to support you. There's a big scholarship around that aspect, so just worried about the differences within human uh, access to a healthy environment. Ecological justice, advocating for conservation of ecological well-being, not for the sake of humans, but because we value, the environment has its value of its own, so that's a, a different kind of approach to what justice might look like. And then finally, species justice, where I would argue most of my research sits, is this idea that other species, other beings <coughs> besides humans, have a right to justice too. And that is not only on the individual level, where an individual non-human animal deserves to be free of suffering and injury, but on an institutional level as well. We have so much ingrained suffering of other creatures. Uh, industrial farming, uh, zoos, entertainment industries, that that is a justice issue as well for, for those that are not human. And the, largely drawing again on Rob White's work there. And the non-human, so Pierce Byrne, a professor of sociology at the University of Southern Maine, uh, he talks even when we finally recognize that their non-humans are victims of crime, there is still a gradation within that of how we actually treat them. And a majority, at least, uh, of, of Western legal systems, <coughs> excuse me, animals, plants, are private property. They're just something that belongs to humans. So their suffering, loss, is economically necessary. And we see that in industrial agriculture. It's all justified. We need to eat, or humans need to make money. So it's okay that the animals are suffering. We even see that on the level of companion animals. There's this campaign that you might have seen actually going through uh, the various stages of parliament to, be, to try to change the law in the UK, uh, that your companion animal is still your property. So if someone were to break into your house and steal your dog, that's the same as if they stole your laptop. And arguably, I think, emotionally, that is a very different kind of theft. Uh, so there's movement in this country to change that, but predominantly non-human animals are simply human property. Piers also talks about the prototypes of criminality in humans. So humans are violent because we've evolved from animals who were quite violent. Uh, and we see that in the criminological literature as well. Though we rarely see, maybe never, the opposite, that human or non-human animals are also quite compassionate. So why haven't we we've taken that from them as well? Uh, the narrative is really all about our violence stems from us coming, coming from animals or from beasts. The other narrative we see in criminology, uh, and in green criminology too, the abuse of non-human animals signifies inner human violence. Uh, and I myself have even working on a small project on this, arguing that there is this, and it gets quoted quite often, there's even a hashtag on Twitter now, you can follow the link, uh, that it is because, uh, or if you see the pattern of some of being violent to non-human animals, chances are they will progress to actually being violent to other humans. Uh, maybe some uh, validity to that, but it, it, it's still something that's being tested. And then finally, Pierce moves us to the point where, where my research would sit, or where a lot of uh, green criminological research is now going, 
that actually non-human animals should be bearers of rights on their own. Um, and there's also obviously a lot of debate about what we mean about rights or, or personhood or, or how we're going to actually it, to work towards that kind of emancipation. It could be uh, sort of more this welfare paradigm that non-human animals can still be used for food, We're still gonna have some sort of industrial farming uh, because that harm is um, justified in terms of food, but we're going to minimize the amount of suffering it has. And that's sort of just keeping the status quo, right? That we're going to still do what we're doing, but try to make the pig as happy as it can be during its life or, or, or some equivalent. There's those that argue, though, that there's the right to live free of human interference, uh, that we shouldn't be um, exploiting, using, commodifying animals or wildlife in any form, and that so we should be abolishing the exploitation across the board, that we shouldn't be using animals at all. Uh, and again, this drawing on, on Burton's work. And he even calls so much for in his, in his last book in 2018 about having the whole concept dedicated to this about fairy aside. Why don't we have a word for when an animal dies? Why isn't that the equivalent of a murder, of a homicide? Why isn't it a fairy aside? Uh, and then radical sort of movement of that is can we move this even further beyond non-human animals? What about trees? What about landscapes? Do they have rights? And we see uh, that movement, don't we, uh, of rivers having rights now in New Zealand recognizes legal persons. It doesn't mean they're human, but it recognizes them in our legal system. And of course, this always comes to clash with the question, the pushback about aren't human rights more important? Uh, and that's, that's not one of the solutions I'm going to offer you this evening, unfortunately, but uh, that is clearly at, at the center of, of what I try to answer. So just to, to summarize that, we started from a very anthropocentric or human-centered, positivistic meaning very legal uh, limitations to what we're researching. But harm uh, becomes visible. It becomes a, a legitimate idea or subject for inquiry. And environmental justice, while still anthropocentric, it really moves us on to, to where a lot of the research is coming from now, which is this green criminology that recognizes that there's more victims than just human victims. And I think, you know, how I actually teach green criminology here at Northumbria, when I have the chance and students are interested, uh, that there's this really uh, powerful, I think, uh, conceptualization coming out of Stockholm uh, from uh, Rockwell and other colleagues there about the nine planetary boundaries. And we can really look at the planetary health uh, if we look at these boundaries. Uh, and obviously you can see there that uh, the green saying we're, it, we're, we're within a limitation where the planet can, can take the kind of uh, excess or the, the output that the humans, uh, humans in particular, are putting into the, into the environment. And the yellow means that uh, we've crossed the boundary, and then obviously that is the red there, the orange there, you can see is beyond uncertainty. It's a really high risk kind of activity that humans are engaging in. Some of these we just we don't even actually have any data. We don't know how to quantify that. And that's, you can see there, that's the novel entities in the atmosphere of aerosol. And what that means is that we don't actually know what's safe level of certain pollutants. Are there safe level of pollutants to be putting into to different parts of, of the atmosphere or into our environment? Ozone depletion, still within levels, and a bit of a success story in terms of the environment that we've actually managed to, to repair a lot of the damage done to the ozone. Ocean acidification, these are problems of uh, pollutants going in and the, and the ocean becoming more and more acidic. Though we, this is already creating problems in certain places around coral reefs where you see the bleaching is, is linked to ocean acidification and ocean temperature. But you can see some really alarming thing, things there. So the biogeochemical flows, and the P and the M stand for phosphorus and nitrogen, uh, and these almost completely stem from industrial agriculture. Uh, and I've written about this uh, a bit in the UK around uh, the industrialization uh, of pig farming in the Midlands and the proposal for, for mega pig farms where you have uh, 25,000 pigs on a farm and, and this 
nitrogen and phosphorus is coming from all this excrement per cake, what do you do with it? Uh, there's, you know, go into disgusting conversations about <laughs> slurry ponds and where you keep manure and how this actually impacts on the environment. Uh, but all of that phosphorus and nitrogen is coming from industrial agriculture, from the non-human animals, but also then from synthesized chemicals around pesticides and fertilizers and all of this going into the environment. And then where I think a majority of my research is sitting in is in that upper, uh, your left, biosphere integrity. Uh, and it, they break it down um, at the Resilience Center around two different kinds of biodiversity. So if we have an ecosystem, there's the number of species within it, which is one kind of biodiversity. Uh, so is it lots and rich? And the other kind of biodiversity, meaning within a species, how much genetic diversity is there? And, and there's lots of examples of species where this, this is just lost. Uh, cheetahs are often used as an example where they're almost all identical um, because they're so inbred and very similar. So if you lose that kind of biodiversity, that's really problematic as well. Uh, and so much of my research is really sat around um, loss of biodiversity. And while I think this is a very powerful indicator of all of these environmental crises uh, that we're living through, what it doesn't actually capture uh, is the element around the non-human suffering. What is the individual experience uh, of non-human beings uh, within all of that? But there's a massive amount of commodification that goes on uh, related to this. Uh, Chris is more of an expert uh, PhD student looking at the badger call, but uh, we could talk about the individual experience uh, of badgers in the UK. 100,000 badgers have been killed uh, within the last few years because there's some tenuous connection with uh, bovine tuberculosis in, in industrial agriculture. So you can imagine on an individual level, but also on, the, on an institutional level. Fur farming, I've done a fair bit of research on this. this is one of the very first projects I did during my PhD around uh, fur coming out of Russia. Uh, and you have a, again, an, an industry based around the exploitation of animals. Uh, and in this case, um, auction houses based in St. Petersburg, maybe in Leipzig, Germany, where you just have a tremendous amount of corruption happening, where there's <coughs> lots of laundering going on, where there should be X number of, this is a mink, species in my research it was around uh, sable, which is a, an amazing animal with this very dense fur. Uh, just this <clears throat> laundering that goes on where you have however many times more at the auction house that shouldn't be there that's actually been allowed to be killed. But then there's also this issue around the individual lives of these uh, mink or pick a species that are living in, in factory fur farms. I mentioned around industrial pig farming. It might be a bit better in the UK, uh, where there's sort of more legislation around what you see here around these kinds of, of birding crates or, or the crates that, uh, that the female pig will live in. Uh, but if you can imagine the sort of, sort of life that you spend most of your existence in, the, in this sort of space. Uh, there's some really powerful work going on by the Non-Human Rights uh, Project in the US about uh, what about species like uh, elephants that are actually quite social. They're forced to live by themselves for, for decades. Uh, in, the, in this particular case from Connecticut, um, this elephant has been on her own for 37 years. She's never been around another elephant. Uh, and what kind of suffering and trauma does that actually create, excuse me, create for her? Issues around sport. Uh, we, we see that maybe in the Northeast uh, around greyhound racing uh, is, is one version of that talk to about badger baiting and these kinds of blood sports. So there's all of this element of, of, the, of the suffering uh, of individual non-humans that I might and others argue we should be talking about in criminology because that's what the discipline is designed for to talk challenging harms uh, and injury. And we're not just cruel to our sporting animals or wildlife. The RSPCA in England and Wales gets over a million phone calls a year based around neglect or suspected abuse uh, of domestic animals, so of our companion animals, those that many of us would consider our family. So uh, it isn't just 
other you know, wildlife, uh, it's really even within our homes that there's a lot of suffering of, of the non-human. And much of my research is actually centered around wildlife trafficking. Uh, and this is a categories of demand that I proposed uh, in the first book I wrote back in 2013 uh, that talked about uh, not the motivations about why people are killing wildlife, uh, which is another discussion around um, where often it gets turned in terms of poverty, actually, I think the, the bigger discussion is around greed uh, and luxury, which is mostly what I was trying to capture within these categories of demand, is that why do we want the wildlife that's actually being killed? Uh, and it gets processed, so uh, it isn't just the non-human animal, we are also talking about plants here, lots of timber uh, that gets trafficked uh, or illegally logged, illegally cut to make furniture that might be quite luxurious and extravagant, uh, but all of the mention of, that I said earlier around furs, around skins, um, the one that you can see there in the middle of the screen is the vicuña, which is a kind of uh, llama or camelid uh, that lives in South America, that it, historically they would just be killed uh, for this amazing wool that they have, um, but processes have changed and they're actually shearing them and have come up with different ways to still still get the same product. Uh, collector's items, this is one of the big luxury reasons why wildlife are killed, uh, either well, killed or actually just captured, or as uh, my good colleague at the University of Oslo has written about, why don't we use the word kidnapped um, uh, when we're talking about taking wildlife from their homes. So having a rare species as part of some collection at home, having some exotic companion animal, and we see this quite a bit in the Middle East of having a cheetah in a, in a house or, or something like that. Of course, the demand for food, uh, we've seen, uh, or uh, my, my former PhD student, um, he's back in Vietnam, um, he's, he wrote a lot about this around wildlife restaurants in Hanoi, where you can go and have um, these exotic kinds of meats. Um, it could be bush meat, which is a term commonly used more in Africa, but really just refers to any sort of wild caught uh, meat. And then caviar, which is a one that if you look at the history has gone quite uh, a different direction. It used to be poor people's food that they would catch the sturgeon species and, and eat the eggs. Um, and now it is this really luxurious food that's quite expensive. You might have just seen in the news a few days ago that uh, the last Chinese paddlefish uh, which is a form of caviar, uh, is extinct. Uh, and we've seen this in other places in the world. In the US, in the Hudson River, there used to be paddlefish species, but we've just eaten them out of existence. Traditional medicines is also another big source of the killing, murder of wildlife. Uh, we see it not just of, again, your non-human animals, but of your uh, plant species as well. And ginseng has actually been in the news just this week around uh, this species being pushed to the brink of extinction with the belief that these the sorts of consumption has properties that are going to help with a different variety of, of ailments. And then at the edges of those Venn diagrams, you can see so, some overlap, obviously. Um, ivory is one that most of us probably know about. I argue that it sits at this edge of, of being a processed commodity because we don't just have them like, well, we might have just a, a big tusk, but normally it's manufactured and, and carved into something else, but because it is a collector's item. So, that, so there certainly are, are overlaps where these, where these categories are sitting. So my, my argument then is, is through all that um, depressing rather <laughs> overview of environmental crises and, and the suffering of, of other beings is that there really is the need uh, for green criminology and then making this kind of suffering and, and injury much more visible. That yes, we can and we should absolutely deal with all of the human suffering and, and the problems in that sphere, but there's still space to actually address these other issues that we're causing. And how my work, my collaborative work, uh, tries to go about doing that is, is through the three things that I mentioned around harm, around violence, and around speciesism. Uh, and to start to talk about harm, uh, maybe surprisingly, if you look at the criminological literature, it's pretty vague. No one's really 
saying what is harm. Uh, and clear back in the 1850s, Mills actually talks about what the harm principle is. Uh, and it is, as a society, we can limit or restrict actions that harm others. It's fairly straightforward. But when you get into the, the nitty gritty of that and the contesting issues of what harm is and people's maybe differing definitions of what harm is, Harcourt, you know, 140 years later, talks about the collapse of this principle is that when you have competing ideas of harm or competing interests, everything is harmful and then the whole idea just collapses under itself. And what we see in the criminological literature in particular uh, is discussions around harm tend to be only about physical harm, uh, abuse, uh, physical injury, and again, completely human-centric, we're only talking about injury or harm to people. That leaves a very vague, undefined kind of area, and it's relativistic about, you know, maybe you think something is harm and I don't, so uh, again, about these competing interests. Uh, so I mentioned my partner at Gibney, he and I have a, have a article coming out, it's been accepted, just waiting for those proofs, as we do, that uh, talks about what well, we should take a much more philosophical and evolutionary perspective on what harm is. That it is that which makes the survival of life more fragile. Uh, and there's, survival is a very robust and, and deep view of survival, it isn't just that I have enough air breathe and enough water and food, um, but really about what survival means in its, in its fullest kind of sense. And if we're taking these actions that chip away at any life becoming uh, weaker, more fragile, less likely to survive, uh, then we can think of that as, as what harm should be. I think too, in addition to having that bigger definition of harm as a way forward to, to bring visibility uh, to the non-human, that we also need to really reconsider what we think of as violence. Uh, there's, violence is obviously a topic that gets lots of space uh, and literature in it in criminology. And here's a few, and you can see from, from some of these definitions of, of well-known scholars in this area, again, it is very anthropocentric, completely human-centered. We're talking about individual people who are physically threatened, sexually threatened, psychologically harmed, it might be to their others or to themselves even. Uh, so it, again, uh, other than humans are, are largely invisible from that. Interesting, the sociologist in the 19, late 1960s, you can see there, talking about it, it being more than just physicality though, it could be about you not being able to reach your potential. Uh, uh, so if you aren't allowed to flourish or somehow you're born into a structure or into a context where you can't actually realize what sort of great person you could be, that we could consider that as a kind of violence. Uh, he, he refers to that as structural violence or social injustice. So it is about this indirect harm. Someone's not physically directly harming you, but that structure that you've been born into has all of these impacts on you. And this uh, idea about an unequal power some people are uh, a victim to this sort of violence and others aren't. The unequal life chances uh, that you might be subject to uh, in these different contexts. And uh, actually my supervisor when I was at University of Kent doing my PhD, he teaches us around the sociology of violence class, uh, excuse me, Professor Larry Ray. He talks about in his book about violence being all of these things, and I think this really sits with our relationship with the non-human, that at the one time it's universal, violence is all around us, uh, and again, I prefer to the idea of industrial agriculture being a clear indication of, of being universal <coughs> violence. But it's also exceptional, right? Uh, people are very interested in individual, kind of extreme sorts of exceptional forms of violence. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're turned off by it, so we find it repugnant, but it, and then we also commercialize it, that we have uh, mass kinds of harm, institutionalized forms of harms around us. It's instrumental, so it serves a purpose, we get, it, it happens for a reason, so we kill animals so that we can get food, uh, but it can also, violence can be also very expressive uh, in different contexts. And another branch of criminology around culture talks about uh, emotion and why people actually commit acts of violence or, or commit kinds of crimes. 
it being universal, commercialized, instrumental means that violence uh, is not criminal. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be, be looking at it and challenging it. Should we be asking for it to be criminalized? Should we be making a case uh, that we shouldn't be allowing these different kinds of harms? Uh, and it is connected to the body, to pain and vulnerability. And, and based around all of that, all of this, I would say, evidence about what we think of as violence, why don't we then think of all of these different things that we're doing to the environment as a form of violence? Uh, I mentioned again, you know, industrial agriculture. How is the death of one billion non-human animals in this country every year for us to eat? How is that not a form of violence? Or non-human animal abuse, and I mentioned, you know, the RSP having all of these calls about us neglecting our cats or dogs or, or other uh, species. Biodiversity loss as a form of violence, of, of you know, causing extinctions and ecocide on other creatures. Deforestation. Uh, I'm amazed at the research coming out about what we're now learning about trees and about plant life that we might have conceptualized for decades that you know, you're cutting the trees, just this inanimate object that falls over, but we're now learning that they're probably talking to each other and that there's all of these mycorrhizal systems underneath the ground where they're sending help to each other. Uh, and there's the mother tree who actually sends extra resources when another tree is hurt. And I'm, and I'm not saying that they're, that they're sentient or they're persons or anything, but there's just so much we don't know and how can we isn't it possible that that is a form of violence when, when we're causing this kind of destruction? And then around pollution, just the, the violence not only that pollution causes to other species, but what we're doing to ourselves about the unhealthy air uh, that we frequently have to deal with even in this country. I forget what time of year it is that London passes its yearly quota, but it's something like April uh, that it reaches the yearly amount of uh, air pollution that's expected. Um, because of the amount of, of transportation and, and various things that we're just, uh, the carbon and, and greenhouse gases that we're dumping in. And can we not think of that as violence? Uh, uh, because it is causing harm, uh, as I referred to, because it's, it's actually making life and all life much more fragile. And then why uh, I think this is happening uh, and I'm certainly not the one to propose this, and I've got lots of uh, influences and collaborations on this, is that humans tend to be very speciesist, uh, and, and that is the equivalent of being racist or sexist, but that we prioritize human species over other species. Uh, and we talk a lot about this in the book with the best cover ever <laughs> <laughs> of the angry penguin that Angus uh, <coughs> Nurse and I um, are just looking through the proofs now and we'll be out in April. Uh, about all of these, these examples of speciesism where we actually prioritize humans o over everything else and that we can commodify and exploit other species uh, because we put ourselves at the center, which also risks ourselves, but, but there is that element to, to only uh, being worried about humans and making the case that um, speciesism is a kind of prejudice that we should be challenging just like we challenge all other kinds of prejudices. Uh, and we, we're ex expanding on other people's work and making the case in this. We also, uh, I had the, the pleasure of, of working with uh, my Montgomery colleague, I don't think he's here, Paul Biddle, uh, and then my colleague at the University of South Wales, uh, Dr. Jenny Marr, uh, about a scoping research around uh, companion animals uh, and the importation illegally, mostly, and puppy farms. Uh, and we did this for the Scottish government uh, and then DEFRA actually, um, so the Department of Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs uh, supported in this as, as well. And even within, so, as I said before, but, so we other wildlife, but we also don't actually treat our you know, man's best friend very, very well either. Uh, and what we found in, in this piece of research uh, that we finished in um, early 2018 was that even within uh, dogs, uh, there's an incredible amount of speciesism going on. Uh, so we have, we found that uh, bulldogs, and this is an American bulldog, but we found French bulldogs in particular are the most common breed to be advertised uh, in Scottish uh, online advertisements. And that's problematic on lots of levels around inbreeding of French 
French Bulldogs. Um, if any of you have seen them on the street, you would have heard them coming long before you saw them because they have so much trouble breeding um, because of all the, the problems with the inbreeding and the, and the breaking out problem, uh, issues that it creates with the nose. But so we see even within dogs, supposedly our favorite non-human animal, so many issues around speciesism of, of preferring one over the other, making them smaller, making them cuter, like teacup chihuahuas or something. Uh, so issues around that. And around this being industrialized and commodified as well, uh, the Scottish government actually tendered the study because they're worried about puppy farms uh, of these areas, and they haven't actually found any in Scotland. They've been found mostly in the Republic of Ireland or in Eastern Europe and Lithuania and other places. Sorry, Linda. Um, that you have barns with maybe 10,000 breeding females, uh, and they're never allowed to see the light of day. They're just in a, in a wooden box with a water tube going in, and they'll give birth there and they'll live there. And these are the sorts of dogs that we might be buying. Um, unintentionally, we as consumers don't want to be doing that, I'm sure, but because of the elaborate way that this trade works, we're feeding into this kind of, uh, of harm uh, and arguably speciesism of, of commodifying another creature in this way. So I set out the, what I argue is, is this hierarchy, and I, and I originally wrote it, wrote it sorry, around wildlife trafficking, but I think we could apply it uh, to any sort of wildlife crime or non-human animal crime, uh, is that we prioritize ourselves over, over everyone, and uh, wildlife is our livelihood for some people, so, so that gets prioritized. Property owners have a lot of uh, priority um, for uh, preferential treatment when it comes to wildlife, so uh, farmers are allowed to kill pest vermin on their land, um, in only for their own livelihoods, but also so they don't have to worry about you know the fox eating their chicken or or resource competition on a farm. So property owners have a fair amount. Uh, we talk about. And I'm not saying that any of these things are wrong. We should be worried about these things, but why are they prioritized in the way that they are? Uh, so humans get priority. The state uh, gets uh, also prioritized over the non-human animal. And I mentioned around within species, we even have a preference. So much of the wildlife conservation work comes at, or is focused about charismatic megafauna, as it gets referred to. So we, we talk about the elephant and the rhino and we don't care about the tarantula who's also getting trafficked or, or other things like that. We even have a hierarchy, a, a speciesism within plants, uh, preference to trees uh, or our collectible flowers, like we really like orchids and roses, uh, but what does that mean for grass and moss and, and other things that are less visible and less uh, liked by humans? And we even do this within environmental spaces. So much attention gets paid to the Amazon, the well-known hotspot. Um, but what about these other areas of really rich biodiversity? Uh, I've had a fair amount of research uh, in Mexico over the last four years. Uh, and they are so frustrated that on the global scale that they're just ignored. Uh, even though you have incredibly rich areas in Mexico, um, I mentioned tarantula and cacti. Pretty much most of them are endemic to Mexico um, because they have these amazing deserts that exist nowhere else. And so that, too, is a hierarchy of, of what sort of environment, what sort of ecosystem that we want to spend all of our time protecting or putting our resources into protecting. Uh, and that's the goal in much of my research is to challenge us. We should be questioning how we get to this stage, how can we actually uh, create better conditions for, to challenge all of this kind of, of speciesism. I, I think I'd be remiss if I also, uh, you know, passionately talking about all these non-human animals. So the non-human animals who have influenced me. So I grew up in a very beautiful part of the world. Uh, that upper right picture uh, is a look or is a picture out the picture window in, in the childhood home where my parents still live. So those are three snow-capped mountains all year round. 
And that certainly has an impact on, on who I've become and my passion around the environment and, and, uh, and for non-human species. And any of you who have probably talked to me for five minutes know I'm uh, a passionate dog lover, and there he is. Um, and I, I would, would be very remiss if I didn't mention, you know, much of this research has been him sitting next to me for the last six years while I, <laughs> I'm typing out writing all of these rant about um, we've got to be better for non-human animals. Uh, so you know, he, that relationship has really affected a lot of my thoughts on what harm, violence, and speciesism actually are. Uh, and having that relationship really inspires me to carry on challenging human-centeredness of criminology uh, as my discipline, uh, but also the world. Thank you. Design and Social Sciences here at uh, Northumbria, and my job is to um, chair some questions that Tanya has uh, um, uh, um, uh, said that she will answer from you tonight. So we've got a, we've got a few minutes, so um, uh, over to you. I will allow you to collect some thoughts then whilst I ask <laughs> questions. Uh, I have quite a lot of questions actually. Uh, um, uh, so I guess that my the, my first question. Um, is about your your hierarchy of of uh, um, uh, you know of, of, uh, I can't remember what you described it there, but the, the route to the higher. And I guess that my challenge would be around the the point that they're blurring between those things because you can think of of uh, examples, can't you, of where certainly there are human communities who are who are regarded by states, for example, rather uh, rather less well than mm -hmm. than animal populations. And I think one of the, um, uh, um, uh, I've done quite a lot of work in Australia, um, and there was a, a, I remember being in Australia where there were two items on the news which were next to one another. The first was about the movement of uh, refugee populations to Malaysia, um, uh, and how this was a, you know, an absolute um, uh, a necessity, you know, the notion of the kind of the boat people and the protecting of Australian borders. And then the next item on the news was about the ban on movement of cattle to Malaysia because of the, the, that, that was um, it, animal welfare st standards there were, were, were not uh, um, uh, at, at the kind of level that the Australian states approved. So this, this absolutely kind of contrast between the way in which the non-human population were, were, was regarded and the human population was the other way around, as it were. The, yeah. the, the treatment of that refugee population was seen as kind of, that was less important so I just, I guess, you know, is there a sense in which these things are, are more blurry at times? No, it's a great point. And I think Francis could probably answer this better than me because his experience in Mozambique. But I think you're, you're right. And what struck me as you were saying, uh, and I, I do think there is a blurry tonight, and I wonder from the examples that you gave if, if still behind that is what I argue around.
one more. But how do we deal in green criminology with the problem of, and this is like the environmental thing where we will be needing to be in the West for years, and that is fine, but now that the Chinese and the Indians and whatever, we go, oh no, 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 you can't eat beef because, you know, you've screwed everything up and now you can't do what, you can't have air conditioning because we've ruined the environment and so you can't have it now. So how do we deal with that kind of problem of us now telling the people we've been exploiting all their resources for years that, mm -hmm. oh, now you're not allowed to do it because we've decided the environment is protecting us. Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly think that that's so challenging because it does come across quite, I, I think all of us working in academia around post-colonial and imperialism mm -hmm. issues that, uh, that are faced when you're, you're offering those solutions from the West. Uh, and, I, and I do think it is, it's something about dialogue Challenging, um, uh, thought-provoking, I think warm uh, um, lecture, and um, uh, I, I think um, well, I, I I I will go away with some extraordinary uh, rich things to, to think about, and and be slightly troubled. But I was also very um, uh, pleased that in answer to one of your questions, you gave us uh, reasons for for hope. So uh, um, thank you very much, Professor Kanye White.